even assuming that a former president is entitled to some immunity for official acts, that immunity should not be held to bar this prosecution. First, a president's alleged criminal scheme to overturn an election and thwart the peaceful transfer of power to his lawfully elected successor is a para paradigmatic example of conduct that should not be immunized, even if other conduct should be. Second, at the core of the charged conspiracies is a private scheme with private actors to achieve a private end, petitioners' efforts to remain in power by fraud. Thus, even if the court determines that some form of official immunity exists and may apply to some acts alleged in this case, the court should remand so the district court can address the issues through evidentiary and instructional rulings at trial. This case should be remanded for trial because any novel immunity from criminal liability for a former president's official acts should not apply to the alleged, to the allegations in this case. Let me read that again. This case should be remanded for trial because any novel immunity from criminal liability for a former president's official acts should not apply to allegations in this case. A president's alleged criminal scheme to use his official powers to overturn the presidential election and thwart peaceful transfer of power frustrates core constitutional provisions that protect democracy. These provisions include the term of office clause which is the Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 1, the provision of electing presidents, which is Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2, and the establishment of successor provision in the 20, about the, wait, provision in the 20th Amendment. Petitioners' concerns about chilling official conduct that violates those provisions rings hollow because no president has an Article II interest in using crimes to give himself a second term after an election he lost. Any remand should permit the district court to make evidentiary and instructional rulings. Even if this court is, were inclined to recognize some immunity for a former president's official acts, it should remand for trial because the indictment alleges substantial private conduct in service of petitioner's private aim. The district court may, can make evidentiary rulings and craft appropriate jury instructions for trial, clarifying that petitioner may be held criminally liable based only on the private conduct alleged in the indictment even though the jury could consider official acts evidence for limited or spe specified purposes. Petitioner's use of official power was merely an additional means of achieving a private aim to perpetuate his term in office. That is prosecutable based on private conduct. The conspiracy centrally embraced private actors agreeing with petitioner to achieve his private end through private means. In particular, petitioner is alleged to have conspired with four private attorneys and a private political consult consultant in his effort as a candidate to subvert the election results. That alleged conducts falls well outside any conception of presidential official acts. Petitioner confirmed that his acts in a petitioner confirmed that he acted in a private capacity by seeking First Amendment protection for his false speech and moving to dismiss the entire indictment on that basis. So that's how one of Donald Trump's motions to dismiss comes back to Biden. The district court correctly held that the president, that the petitioner's false speech in furtherance of the charged conspiracies 
is not constitutionally protected. But the petitioner's assertion of private First Amendment rights speaks volumes about the private character of the charged offenses. So here, Jack Smith is using one of Donald Trump's motion to dismiss against him. And I think it's wonderful. That petitioner also engaged in official conduct that was interview that was intertwined with this private means of attaining conspiracy's aim should not immunize all his conduct. No available, no valid claim of blanket immunity should attach to a non-immune conspiracy committed with private actors through private conduct to obtain a private end simply because a former president also used official powers to further the conspiracy. If the court were to find that some form of immunity for criminal prosecution for a former president's official acts exists, that immunity should not preclude all evidentiary issues of official acts in a trial based on petitioner's purely private conduct. So I want to make something clear here. If the So since Jack Smith has started talking about if the court were to find some sort of immunity for criminal prosecution of a former president's official acts, that is an if, that is a contingency. That is the argument made here over and over again is an alternative argument that says that if SCOTUS says that there is some form of immunity that former POTUSes have while they can commit official acts while in office, because that's how the question was presented by SCOTUS, uh, you know, um, alleged official acts, there is now Jack Smith is breaking that down to say that the acts committed were private conduct. And if the court, the court has to take into consideration that these were private, that petitioner, that evidentiary use parallels the established rule in comparable context. For instance, the First Amendment prohibits its criminaliz criminalizing most speech or other protected other protected expression, but it does not prohibit the evidentiary use of speech, including to prove motive or intent. And if petitioner objects to such rulings, he can seek a appellate review. Through evidentiary rulings and instructions to the jury, the district court can make clear the evidence concerning and protected official acts is to be considered only for purposes for which it was admitted. 